Hello and welcome to a workshop I've created titled Providing Neurodiversity Affirming Client Support. This workshop is intended to be used for service providers and people who wish to provide neurodiversity affirming support in any other capacity. I am happy to bring this workshop to you as part of NA National Accessibility Week 2024. So before I get into my presentation, I'd like to briefly introduce myself and talk about why it is that I'm talking about this subject today. So first and foremost, I always like to preface it by saying that I am somebody who has lived experience as an autistic person and I am labeled as an autistic person. I believe that this is important to say um, because there's a lot of different research and voices and experiences that are often taken as uh, more important than the words and the research and the experience done from people in our own communities. So I like to kind of prioritize saying that first as part of nothing about us without us. Next, I have an ac academic background in critical disability research and studies. So it's sort of a portion of health policy, but I have been academically trained to look at disability from a critical disability approach, which means that I look at these more underlying and root systemic causes of what creates the experience of disability. And finally, I've been working within the nonprofit world in the last couple of years, supporting autistic and neurodivergent community members and clients. So today's agenda, I'll briefly go through because I think it's a good idea to know what to expect. I always start out with language. Language in the disability community is extremely fluid and changes and can kind of move here and there from day to day. Some things do stay the same and we'll kind of discuss that a little bit more, but I always like to start out all on the same page. We then move into the theoretical stuff. So this is a little bit more about disability justice and disability in itself as a construction and neurodiversity and all of those sorts of things. Uh, we then go into all about autism and neurodivergency, so really kind of getting into the meat of sort of the really important topics that service providers should be aware of in order to provide affirming support for neurodivergent clients and, and participants in their programs. And finally, we end up into the action, which is how to start doing that neurodiversity affirming support. Uh, just a small amount at the end because the bulk of this presentation is based towards getting you to a point where you can feel comfortable with that foundational knowledge about neurodivergence. So starting out with language. Disabled is the first one that I want to cover because this is a world word that is very contentious in the nonprofit world. If you are a service provider and maybe someone who doesn't identify as disabled, this word may make you sort of jump back and coil back with fear because this is a word that in an ableist society we've learned is a bad word. We like to flower it up with euphemisms and ways of making it sound better. We like to say superpower and all of these different things to avoid saying the word disabled. Many disability rights activists, however, have actually pushed back against this and have been actively reclaiming that word of disabled. I'm a disabled person. And this is because we, first of all, don't believe that it is inherently negative. We think that the world constructs it, constructs it as negative, um, but also that being disabled is just another part of the diversity of human experience. We just aren't in a society that uh, allows us to live freely or even survive or live in general. Uh, we have a world that creates that disability. So we are disabled by the society and not necessarily from something internal that's broken or not working inside of us. So kind of with similar reasons, a lot of people in the autistic community have wholeheartedly adopted the word autistic, which we call identity first. 
If you're a service provider, you've probably heard a little bit of both. We're really coming a lot more into an understanding of identity first language, but I still do work with progressive people who keep up to date, who are a little bit confused about the language to use. So hopefully this will sort of clear it up. Um, the autistic community overwhelmingly chooses to use identity first language, but that does not mean that everybody does. There are some people who are not as embedded in this community, who aren't as embedded in activism, or maybe they have their other reasons for choosing to use um, other ways of referring to themselves, like I'm a person with autism. Um, however, generally you will see that service providers and non-disabled, non-autistic people will like to say that person has autism and sort of the background on why that is, is because people believe that um, we need to emphasize the person first and we don't want to look at this sort of neg thing that we see as negative that's attached to that person. They just have it, sort of like a symptom or um, a, an illness or something. However, a lot of our community have adopted I'm an autistic person to say that this is just who I am. It's not something that I have. It's not something separate than me. Um, for example, like I'm a woman, I, I don't have women, I am a woman. So very, very similar to those reasons. It's not something that is able to be removed or be without. That is who I am and uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So with the kind of adoption of this language, identity first language, autistic person, um, has come a lot of other movements. So um, you'll see it used in the neurodiversity movement and you'll see it in sort of autistic pride movements as well. So it's been really useful in that way. And if you're a service provider, it's really useful to understand this debate and really sort of dig into the reasons why and sort of the diversity and the way in which people will describe themselves. But a general, I actually, my picture cuts it off a little bit, but a good way to start if you are a non-autistic service provider is use identity first language first. And if somebody corrects you, you can then switch it over. Um, you can also alternatively ask somebody what they prefer as well. So just kind of in the realm of language, since we're talking about the word disabled and the word autistic, are autistic people disabled? Because this might be something that kind of comes up when we're talking about those two different things. So first and foremost, um, generally in the disability activism kind of community, people who are autistic do consider themselves as disabled. And it's for the same reasons that I was talking about in the disability section or the disabled section here, which is uh, our community believes that we are disabled, but by society, not by autism. Um, and again, we have such a diverse range of experiences in the disability community, in the autistic community, and everybody is going to have a different way of referring to themselves or different nuances or different ways that it's going to be different. So this is just a general sort of overview of the climate in the autistic community. But of course, every individual person's experiences with their own um, identity is totally valid. And really, if you've met one autistic person, you've only met one, as we like to say. So these are uh, things that could vary from person to person. So kind of along with this, you've probably heard of either the social model or the medical model of disability. And in service provision for folks with disabilities, these are really, really important things to understand. So again, really driving it home, the social model is a way of looking at disability that understands disability as constructed by society and not by internal or external shortcomings or deficits in the person. So in other words, we are not inherently broken as people who are neurodivergent or disabled in any way. It's really society that kind of creates the appearance of that brokenness because society doesn't create a world that keeps different minds and different body minds in mind when creating spaces. So one of the really, really important things that we need to know in order to move forward into neurodiversity affirming care is disability justice. 
And this is a topic that's extremely important and extremely close to my heart and something that I believe needs to be discussed, critically needs to be discussed when we are talking about disability. This is also a word and a term that is highly misunderstood and um, misused by folks in service provision and uh, in sort of disability advocacy at large. I have recently been speaking to somebody who I said disability justice to, and they started assuming that it was about legal sort of things. Um, this couldn't be further from the truth, but here we are to unpack it a little bit more. So basically, disability justice is a movement and a body of work created by queer, trans, people of color who are disabled. This movement and this body of work was created because the people in the movement couldn't see themselves reflected in mainstream disability activism that often only said, okay, here's this issue about disability and didn't look at all the intersecting things like, what does it mean to be trans and disabled? What does it mean to be a person of color and disabled? What does it mean to be a migrant person and disabled? And how do those things work together? Um, and they also found that um, the mainstream disability rights movement, although important, wasn't actively advocating for the things that were really, really critical to even save lives of people who are at that intersection of uh, racialization and disability and queerness. Uh, so for example, police violence, it's not really talked about as much in mainstream sort of white disability movements, but it is something that is needed to be discussed. So all of these are sort of the reasons why the disability justice movement was created and formed. And as you can see on the left here, this is a graphic created by Sins Invalid, which is a great performance group that uses a disability justice lens. And they have, um, as a group, created these 10 principles of disability justice that really outline the principles of doing disability justice well and sort of the ethics behind it. And I won't go through all of them, and I really highly encourage you to visit the website sinsinvalid.org to see more and see more writings from people who created this movement. Um, but you can just see at the top here, I'll, I'll look at the first two, intersectionality. So, you know, understanding that we aren't just looking at ableism when we're doing disability justice activism. We are also looking at the ways that that intersects with white supremacy and economic systems like capitalism and heteropatriarchy and all of these different systems of oppression that create what we now see as disability. We then have the second tenet, which is leadership of the most impacted. And people in the disability justice movement believe that people who are the most impacted by multiple systems of oppression at once know those systems so well because they have to know those systems in order to survive. So therefore, these folks should be the people that we are centering and listening to. So those are just a few of the tenets of the disability justice movement. And then you can see on the other side of the screen here, I have a little bit of an understanding of intersectionality. And I like this graphic. I've used it a couple of different times. But again, I never think that neurodivergence and the discussion of neurodivergence and disability at large should ever be had without understanding how it is always intricately related to all different aspects of people's identities. And this is something that I believe we could do better in the disability advocacy community. So just to really sort of emphasize from somebody's lived experience why disability justice is important, we have this word and quote from Mia Mingus. So as a queer disabled woman of color, disability justice feels like a political home for me a place where I can engage in conversations about disability and race and gender and queerness and capitalism and more. I tried to look to the disability rights movement, but I saw very few leaders who reflected me and I found that, for the most part, disability was being talked about as this isolated single issue. Having been involved in racial justice, 
queer liberation, reproductive justice, and feminist movements most of my life. I have <laughs> I have encountered I have rarely encountered spaces that address disability or connected it with other issues. So in essence, um, and this is not a full look at disability justice, I really encourage you to look at Sins, Sins Invalid for a place to move forward for more information. Um, but in general, um, it's a justice and liberatory approach. So it really looks at those root systems of oppression and asks for liberation, not just let's meet halfway on you know, our rights. So it really emphasizes a, a little bit more of that liberatory approach. It also does not recognize disability as a single issue. It recognizes all of those different ways that it can intersect. We're not talking about disability unless we're also talking about race at the same time. So all of those sorts of things are really tied in. It centers the most marginalized. We're not looking um, only at one experience, limited experience of disability. We're looking at people who are experiencing multiple systems of oppression at once, and we're centering those voices in this movement. Disability justice is concerned with police violence. So again, this is something extremely, extremely important in the disability advocacy community and something as service providers, we should be more than aware of. Disabled people are way more likely to be um, harmed at the hands of police and face police brutality. And this is something that all of us should be advocating for in our work, but it's not something that we see as much as we should. So disability justice in that framework really advocates for looking at issues like this. They also look at prisons and institutionalization and how disabled racialized people are way more likely to be institutionalized in um, these residential services and also within prisons. They also talk about the lack of autonomy for disabled people. And one of the tenants, if you might have seen it, was looking at people and assuming that they are whole human beings. No matter what they produce, no matter what they do, they are whole just because they're born. And finally, something that I think is really important in this work is addressing the way that white people who are disabled can still wield privilege. I think that this is something that we come up against when we have, I think, great intentions to try to understand why is it that somebody does something the way that they are doing it. And we understand that disability can sometimes be something that, you know, um, provides a reason for this. But oftentimes in mainstream disability movements, we really don't understand the nuances of how somebody could also be oppressed in one area, but also oppress others in other areas. So disability justice has really done a lot of work in really understanding and unpacking those sorts of nuances. So getting into disability and neurodivergence and really kind of diving deeper into this. A lot of people think that neurodivergence and neurodiversity are one and the same. You will often see people conflating these two words and using them interchangeably. However, they are definitely very different and something that is worth unpacking if we want to support neurodivergent people. So neurodivergence, first of all, is the idea that somebody is diverging from what a neurotypical brain is. So we have this imaginary normal brain as if you work in this field, I'm sure you've started to unpack and have been unpacking that, you know, there really is no such thing as a typical brain, but neurodivergence um, more visibly diverts from what that typical brain looks like. And then we have neurodiversity, which just describes all of the different ways that brains can be diverse. So this also includes neurotypical people. So I imagine it almost like um, a circle. So we have the larger circle, which is neurodiversity, and that's just everybody. And then we have a slightly smaller circle, which is neurodivergence. And this is where people specifically identify or are labeled by other people as diverging from what is not typical. So hopefully that clears it up a little bit. Um, I am not neurodiverse, I am neurodivergent. 
So another thing that I think we don't often unpack and we kind of go with the word is neurodivergence. I see that it's often associated with ADHD or autism, but actually neurodivergence really encompasses any way, as I had just said, that a brain can be different than what we view as a typical brain. So this could be anything from dementia, which my box is cutting off a little bit, um, but I have dementia right here um, because, you know, you end up, your brain ends up being different than what it was and um, constructed by society as um, changing in a negative way often. We have hearing voices, so people who experiencing experience hearing voices, they are also neurodivergent. Um, mental illness and mental health diagnoses, those are all neurodivergence. And basically anything else you can think of is technically neurodivergent. So specifically looking at autism and narrowing it down just a little bit more as we progress, um, I want to start off by showing you this great screenshot of a panel. Uh, this was quite controversial uh, in Nova Scotia, where um, there was this big panel about uh, women's contributions to security solutions. And um, people were quite upset, and I think justifiably so, that there were no women on the panel to talk about women's contributions. And I think that this is totally fair. Um, however, we have this happen all the time to us in the disability and specifically in the autistic community. Parents, doctors, and also nonprofit professionals, service providers, psychiatrists are often placed in the role of the autism expert way before we consider autistic people themselves being the experts on their own experiences. We have um, so many charities and organizations that focus in on autism across Canada where there are no visibly autistic people or open autistic people on boards, committees, in high up executive leadership teams, or even um, in middle management. Uh, it's quite rare to see that, unfortunately. Um, and I also write here panel discussions, conferences, and nonprofit work in the field of autism is almost always done without us. And sometimes it can be done even in a um, sort of sneaky way where we contract people in for, you know, um, maybe 10 hours a week to sort of consult on something. But when we look at sort of the more long-term, impactful and well-paid jobs in organizations, they aren't necessarily going to openly autistic people. So these are all things that we need to, as service providers, be very conscious of and advocate against. Um, it's not to say that just because somebody is autistic means that they know everything about autism, but what it means is that there should be representation of people in our community when, and meaningful representation when we are talking about our experiences. And we should just be just as angry when we see a panel um, that does not have any autistic people or only has one autistic people um, when we're talking about autism. And this is something that I really think that we can move closer towards uh, in our field. In history, and this is kind of why we've constructed um, the last slide and, and why that ended up happening. Um, autism has always been something that people have been very hyper-focused on curing and fixing. And it is not within the scope of this particular workshop to get into the history of autism science, but I could talk your ear off about it. It's very interesting. Um, but in general, we have spent so much money. We have spent so much time. We've built so many charities and so many organizations, and we've done so many research symposiums looking for cures and interventions and fixes to autistic people or autistic behaviors um, that we actually have forgotten about people who are autistic right here, right now, who are living as children or as adults. So a lot of the same money and resources and time historically has gone into finding that cure, intervention or fix 
and not as much into supporting us day to day and changing the society to be a little bit more accepting of us and who we are. Unfortunately, it is very rare, and this is very important for service providers to know, it's very rare to find supports for autistic children or adults that are not rooted very heavily in the medical model intervention or sort of fixing the traits. And this is something that I say is important for folks in this work, because when we are doing referrals, when we are talking to our autistic and neurodivergent clients about um, different resources they can access in the community, we really have to be careful that we are promoting resources that are not um, going to be focusing in on fixing our clients because we're good people. We don't want that. We want them to go into great hands where people are respecting them and building inclusion and acceptance in society for them. Again, just to really drive it home, autistic people are not asking to be fixed. Oftentimes we are just asking to be understood and included. And this is a great quote um, that I read in a great research article by Morrow, Deck, and Manager in 2008. And this quote says, to what degree does this desire for care disguise a, better, a desire to better control people who may be, by their appearance or actions, disruptive in society? And just to break that down a little bit more, because I think that it's worth breaking down, um, when you are referring people to care or support, um, when you are looking at that resource, is it something that is looking to change that person? Is it telling that person that they are not good as they are? Or is it something that is just looking to make them less disruptive or um, cause less of an inconvenience to people? Another thing to keep in mind is symbols that are generally accepted by the autistic community. I wouldn't want you to send a referral or send a resource to somebody uh, who's autistic and then be deeply offended or have that reflect negatively on your organization. Generally, um, the autistic community uses an infinity sign and this sign, when you see it, for the most part, will for the most part, will refer to an organization or a resource or support created by autistic people and that promotes autistic advocacy and not so much um, something where people outside of the community are coming in and sort of creating things for us. So that's a great sign. And sometimes you'll see the infinity sign in either red or in gold. You'll also look below there and see that we have a couple of different symbols that probably look more familiar. So puzzle pieces, oftentimes, um, you know, the autistic people might, autistic community might see it as a red flag if there are a lot of puzzle pieces. And, um, you know, it's not within the scope, again, of this workshop to really go into why that is and the history of it. But essentially, um, this is a um, symbol that we do not accept as a community because it signals more negative connotations. Um, and then you'll see in the middle there, um, the handprint um, in blue. So blue is not a bad color. However, when you are looking at different resources and materials about autism and you see a very, very heavy, heavy a very, very heavy emphasis on the color blue. Oftentimes that is also rooted in um, ideas of autism that come from the past and autism history and science um, that said that autism is a boy's disease. And again, an overemphasis of the color blue can sometimes not always tip you off to the fact that the organization may not be created by and maintained by and in leadership by autistic people as well. And of course, you know, um, there are great organizations doing great work who may have these things, but again, um, just because you want to provide the best care and the best support to autistic and neurodivergent people, it is good to keep in mind why a client may be thrown back if you know, you show them an organization or a referral that uh, includes these things. P 
People often think of autism as a spectrum that looks like this. So you can imagine the purple over on this side is not autistic at all. And you can imagine over at the red side that it is very, you know, the person is very autistic. However, this is not actually what our spectrum looks like. Um, this is actually, uh, you know, always changing with research, but generally we believe that the spectrum is a lot more of a circular and complex fluid sort of shape where people can be amazing over in the red and in executive functioning. Um, and then maybe they're closer to the center and a little bit less, um, you know, ideal in this area, or maybe they're really sensitive to uh, noises, but they're not as sensitive to test, test, tastes. So it can really be all over the place and really, really speaks to the fact that autism really is a spectrum and can look very different for other people, but it really is not, you're not autistic, you're a little bit autistic, and then you're very autistic. We have not found that to be true. So if you have watched movies or TV shows at all in your life, um, when you think of autism and the stereotypes of autism, you will often think of the shows that are over here on the side. Um, you know, we do have quite a, quite a bit of autism representation in movie and TV shows. It is getting better, but um, usually, typically when we see it, um, we see a boy, a cisgender boy, uh, a white boy specifically, he's very smart, he's socially awkward, and finally the word autism is cut off, but autism is his superpower. And this is kind of a general stereotype of what we think of as autism. And this is problematic and I think conversations are starting to change a little bit more about why there are actually a lot more people who are autistic who do not fit these sort of stereotypes, just like I showed with the spectrum, it really can be quite diverse. The reason why we see this sort of one view of stereotypical autism is because early autism research only really focused in on young white boys. And I will provide resources for you to look a little bit further into this and understand it a little bit more deep in another context. But um, just like a lot of other health research and research in general, um, a very limited um, research sample was used in that early research, which contributes to a lot of the sort of misunderstandings and stereotypes that we see today. And um, another thing that I want to note, too, is that many people are misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed in general. And specifically with autism, the research shows that this is people who are racialized and white women. Um, people in these categories end up receiving other diagnoses or don't even get the chance of getting a diagnosis in the first place. Um, research has actually shown that white women are more likely to get diagnoses around um, anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar disorder, and actually people who are racialized are more likely to get diagnoses like oppositional dis defiant disorder, ODD, and schizophrenia. So really the history of autism research has, and other sorts of systems of oppression that are constantly happening in society doesn't set up a diverse range of people to get the support that they need. So understanding masking a little bit more, um, masking is interesting. It's either conscious or unconscious, um, camouflaging or hiding autistic traits. This unfortunately is really, really tied up with negative consequences such as experiences of anxiety, depression and profound sadness, um, and also self-harm. And it's really important to keep this in mind, especially with what we were just talking about, because there are a lot of people who don't ever get the chance to be labeled or diagnosed or even the chance to internally identify as autistic and live their whole life needing to survive by heavily masking. Um, so what I believe is that we need to build a world where autistic people do not need to mask. 
Um, and with that, I think it's really, really important to emphasize that we also need to build a world that understands that the most marginalized autistic people can't mask and don't have the privilege of being able to mask. And oftentimes those experiences become very erased by the more privileged autistic people who do get to share their experiences and the ways that they experience life. Um, like me, for example, you know, I am a white neurodivergent person who was labeled as such from quite a young age as, as being different. Um, and I've also have the privilege of getting support and becoming um, educated. And not everybody has that experience and not everybody has the chance to have a platform in that way. And we really need to take into account the fact that there are people who don't mask and that we need to be really heavily advocating for a world where those people are completely respected and especially not um, brutalized because, you know, their unmasking, their way of being is seen as a threat in society. And this is especially speaking towards racialized autistic people who don't mask. So communication is really, really important. Like I had said, there are many aspects of autism and neurodivergence that often get left out of mainstream conversations, even within the neurodivergent and autistic community. Um, because like I had been saying with disability justice, the disability and community, you know, it can be mainly dominated by someone who looks a particular way. And in the autistic community, it can be the same. Often the voices that are the loudest and the people that we see um, the most are people who do have the privilege of being able to speak and um, verbally share their words because that's seen as um, more favorable in an ableist society. And we don't often really focus in on the folks who are most marginalized by many different intersections of oppression, just like we were talking about. So with that, it's really important to understand the many ways that people can communicate. So some autistic people communicate like me verbally. Some people may communicate not speaking. Some people may communicate with AAC. Some people may communicate with scripting. Some people may repeat what you say back. There are huge diverse ranges of the way in which that people can communicate. And the other one I forgot to mention is some people can be verbal sometimes and not speak other times. So it really, really depends. In general, AAC, um, there are wonderful, amazing activists and advocates who are AAC users. And this is an area I really highly encourage you to look into if you are a disability support provider who wants to understand how to advocate for your clients. Um, again, scripting, so people might repeat things that they've heard or repeat things that you've said, and kind of the same way at Galalia, repeating sounds, repeating words. It's really important to keep in mind that while some people will have their personality traits medicalized, like we were saying that, you know, autistic people will um, be considered as having that sort of internal deficit that needs to be fixed, racialized autistic people are actually more likely to be criminalized because of racism and ableism. So like I was saying earlier, this disproportionately adds disabled uh, racialize people into prisons and institutions and also at the, the hands of police brutality. And this is extremely, extremely important to keep in mind as a service provider. So we have this great quote by Christiana Obey Summer and the and the article is from Black Autistics Exist, an argument for intersectional disability justice. And Christiana says, when someone like me walks into the room, I don't have the opportunity to negotiate with others which of my identities they intend to hyper-focus on or criticize. I am a package deal. And again, this goes back to what I've been saying throughout this conversation, which is we really need to understand the different ways that people can be multiple different things at once and advocate for all different aspects and understand and respect all different aspects of their identity. 
an autistic person is not just an autistic person. A person who has ADHD is not just someone with ADHD. They are also all of the different intersections of their identities at once. And that's really important when we're supporting people. So thinking about neurodiversity affirming support and thinking about how do I jump into this? How do I start? I've learned sort of the foundations of things and I want to take action. So one of the first really great tangible things that I am always going on about is understanding the word access. And this comes actually rooted from disability justice advocacy and um, this little kind of phrase access over accommodations. I love to talk to employers about when I'm doing work with employers. Um, I write here that while accommodations are extremely important, given the current society that we have set up, um, what would be a really liberatory and justice centered approach would be setting up a society and a world and working together to create a world where we don't need these one off sort of band aid fixes. Um, we can provide a society and do a lot more to not need a lot of the different accommodations that people need to ask for and sort of bargain for and um, define as reasonable to their employers, for example. Um, one example of this is, you know, in a workplace, if you have meetings, giving people an agenda well in advance so people can prepare and um, know what to expect in that meeting. Another example for neurodivergent people is um, bright lights in an office. You know, I've seen many autistic people and neurodivergent people having to um, request covers and request to keep lights off in their house and or in their office. And all of those things could technically be fixed if we just used fluorescent light less because we know that it's not needed in all circumstances and it can certainly cause a lot of harm to people. So what is neurodiversity affirming support? Support that does not attempt to cure, treat, or change. We are affirming people, we are bringing them up, we are empowering them to advocate for themselves and be uh, attached to movements where there is self-advocacy going on. But this also uh, does not mean that it's okay to excuse harmful behavior or allow discrimination or create an unsafe environment for others. And like I had said earlier, this can sometimes lack a little bit of nuance when we are providing support to people. Um, autism does not cause racism or ableism or, you know, any other ways in which we can discriminate or oppress other people. Um, those things exist in all people. And, um, you know, I think that it's important to keep in mind if you do, for example, have a client or um, a staff member or somebody at work who is no neurodivergent, who is being outwardly racist or, or sexist or homophobic, um, that that is not inherent to autism. That is something that needs to be adjusted and um, something that we can kind of call out and work with. Interdependence is another thing that we really need to keep in mind. So in the support field, um, we often have an overemphasis on this idea of independence. We are always talking about how people should become more independent. There are a lot of people who want that for themselves, and that's great. We respect that. However, as service providers, we also need to understand the value of interdependence. So I really liked Mia Mingus's quote from her blog, Leaving Evidence, uh, and she reads, the myth of independence being, of course, that somehow we can and should be able to do everything on our own without any help from anyone. This requires such a high level of privilege, and even then it is still a myth. Whose oppression and exploitation must, must exist for your independence? So again, Mia Mingus and again, folks in the disability justice movement really emphasize, let's look closer on why we are always expecting people to be as independent as possible. Oftentimes we'll see that it lines up very, very closely with expectations that we have as part of, you know, our current econ economic system, our current society set up, and it's not always in the best interest of people who have disabilities and, and what really would help us with ourselves. Um, you know, there's going to be, be people who can't brush their teeth on their own. 
that's not something if, you know, there's going to be people who can't brush their teeth on their own. And because they can't do that does not mean that there are any less. Needing help is another part of society. And it's actually something really, really beautiful that we should look at as another aspect of human connection and natural. So some other things that you can do, again, thinking about access over accommodations. I've mentioned this, not waiting until a client asks for an accommodation to think about accessibility. You're building this into your programs. You're building this into your hiring processes. You're building it into your organization from the start. Understanding the unique dangers that autistic people and in particular racialized autistic people face. Not focusing on and expecting ableist notions of independence. Thinking about access when meetings and events are being created and not afterwards, not as an afterthought, and including that accessibility information on every event page and every step of the hiring process. Not thinking about autism in terms of deficits or even saying that there are these unusual superpowers because that can be very problematic as well. Listening to the voices of autistic people going along with the phrase, nothing about us without us. I have provided all sources discussed, further reading, and any kind of resources that you need that center the voices of neurodivergent and autistic activists and individuals. Um, please refer to this resource handout for any kind of more information and a deeper dive on this subject. There's so much to learn and I really, really encourage this to only be your first stop to look into more and also learn from more diverse voices in the autistic movement, which I hope have been um, promoted in this resource list that you'll be able to have access to. Um, please feel free to contact me, get in contact. If you have any questions, concerns, comments about this workshop, I'd love to hear from you. And I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and a great National Accessibility Week in 2024. Thank you.